Right, it is the uh, time. So uh, welcome everybody to Collecting Ideas, Imagining the Future of Collection Development with Rogan and Jennifer. Thank you very much for taking time to, uh, yeah, it is a cool border. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, taking some time to uh, do this for us today. Uh, so you are in track two, if you're looking for um, the other presentation, that will be in track one, uh, just to give a spiel here like to thank our championship or keep saying championship it's champion sponsors but <laughs> you're all champions so <laughs> uh, so thank you to Movius, equinox and emerald data uh equinox sponsoring the platform uh hopin and emerald data sponsoring the live captioning so there is a link in the chat but i'll be sure to post it periodically throughout the presentation if you have any questions feel free to throw it in chat and i'll make sure our presenters get them otherwise i think that's it for me so uh let's uh, get on with the presentation you want to introduce us, Rogan? Sure, I'll be glad to. Okay. Uh, we have slide that. one. <laughs> slide one. Slide two. There we go. Hi, I'm Rogan Hamby. I work uh, for Equinox. I am a data and project analyst, which basically means that I take data from various things and reshape it to work and whatever we're working with you with. Uh, Coral, Subjects Plus, Evergreen, whatever. Um, and my email and Twitter there, feel free if you have thoughts or comments you want to share afterwards. Maybe you don't want to share them uh, in this forum. Feel free to drop me a note. Um, and I, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said right before we started, but uh, I used to do acquisitions for libraries. Uh, I did adult purchasing for a public library system. This is a topic close to my heart, and I would love to see us develop more baked in functionality to help uh, acquisitions folks do collection development. Jennifer, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, and I'm Jennifer Weston, Product and Education Specialist here at Equinox. And what that rather vague title means is that I really just help with training in a variety of different um, formats. I work a lot with implementation training with libraries that are just um, starting to adopt Evergreen, whether they're an add-on to a consortium or they're a brand new system. Uh, of course, we support other products, but in my Evergreen world, I also help with just doing training as needed. I do some consulting training about, hey, we've been using Evergreen for a long time, but there are particular things we'd like to learn more about. So I do that in both uh, video documentation and print documentation and anyway. Just training in lots of different ways. I'll just say that. Uh, and as Rogan said, my emails there, my Twitter is there too. So you can reach either of us at any time. We're glad to to talk about Evergreen. I if if you haven't heard me uh, at all in the last few years talk about Evergreen, I am a former cataloger, a still veteran cataloger, I guess. I was a technical services manager in public libraries for many years before I came to came to Equinox. So that's kind of where my my um, my perspective perception of the way things happen in public libraries is because I was there and then um, in, in the role of technical services, you do a lot with working with acquisitions. You see how disparate it is. You see how in very many times it's uncoordinated. And the fact that there are so many things you can pay for out there to try to coordinate this is just kind of, as Reagan said, just makes me shake my head because there's so much that we can get out of this uh, ourselves because we know our data, right? As a cataloger, you know your data better than anybody as far as um, you know, what you have in your collection and what you're adding and, and perhaps what you don't have. So my long spiel about why this is kind of a passion project for me too. And Rogan, this is just our description. Yep. We're going to brainstorm. We're going to talk about tools that people would like to see. And that means we want you to be participants. We want you to share your views. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to come into this with the feeling of, oh, I need to be able to completely spec something out. Just feel free to share what you're thinking. Um, and we will follow up with these in Launchpad. And I think that's kind of the key to this conversation too. So many times we have conversations and people have wonderful ideas and they, yeah, they're good ideas. And the next year we talk about them again. So I love the, this is your idea, Rogan. I love that we're gonna capture all this in Launchpad so that we can continue to, uh, to at least point people to the conversations we've had so that people can continue to share. Yeah. All right. Think big. That's okay. kind of my suggestion for the day too, is what could we do? And again, Rogan, I've had this conversation. What would you do if you could just look at all of your data at one time? If you just had this big collection data that was just pulled up, how would you split it apart and start looking at it? You know, if we just had an afternoon to do nothing but analyze your collection, where would you start? And 
speaking from a purely cataloger point of view, your bibliographic data is kind of key to that. So how could we use that in the analysis when we start talking about slicing and filtering and, and combining the different data elements? So, Right. How, how would you combine your bibliographic data with circulation, with patron data, with um, anything? Mm -hmm. no, certainly. All right. So that's our only guideline here is to think big. So with yep. that said, I'm going to share this link in the chat, and I want everybody to be able to... Uh, I'm going to have to undo this for a moment before I can share it. Pardon me. No. There it is. And that way we want everybody to be able to add to it as we go along. I'll be taking, I'll be capturing your comments in the chat and putting them over here as well. But this way you can just, people can just add their notes right onto this. Also, I will say that we can have up, to about six other people talking if you if people would prefer to use their microphones both rogan and i can can add you if you'll just click that little blue button and ask yep. to speak gosh lots of things coming in already rogan i'm gonna <laughs> you want to monitor chat and i'll try to collect some of these onto the form here okay i will watch the chat here okay. um jennifer will type I so will starting we're already moving fast here uh benjamin murphy says a chronological hold requests relevant to a specific author. So when you say relevant, I assume you mean by that author um, or on bibs by that author. Mary says, I'd love an easy way to get search stats based on bib record subjects and item record shelving locations. We can probably just copy and paste some of these. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. That might um uh mary when you say subjects are you're you're thinking by mark subject fields right uh, lindsey stratton better ways to analyze subject heading density and coverage linked uh, items costs interesting uh, benjamin says one to have more circulation data from the bib or even meta level available mm. from the item that's cool. So, Benjamin, uh, are you thinking like averages? You know, here's the average circulation per item on a bib, that sort of thing? Kate says, a big issue for us is pinpointing books that are missing good subject headings and or subject headings altogether. Certainly a valid cataloging concern. Absolutely. The quality of records. Something to help with floating redistribution. Yes, because that's what some of those high pro, high, high uh, cost tools suggest yeah. for you. Yeah, and some of these things related to bib um, quality are certainly valid uh, cataloging concerns. Um, I'm not clear maybe on how some of them relate to collection development directly, although indirectly they certainly do because they affect discoverability and all of that, which is going to affect circulation. Okay, if I, if I want to see how many books I have on a certain subject, how many am I missing because those subject headings aren't robust in records? Uh -huh. I have thoughts in a copy and pasting. I'm, I'm not good at multitasking like that, but I heard that one because that's my thought too. I would love to see the ability to say, what are you missing? And that what yep. are you missing is, are you missing subject headings? And you can't really tell what you have, can you? I mean, other than you. Yeah. Um, and that makes me with. think of another one, um, which is identifying missing parts of series. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to have a tool that, you know, could identify possible missing parts of series? Benjamin says, yes, thinking about buying a book, here's the author and how popular their titles have been. I think that'd be a great thing for a sort of dashboard-ish widget. Oh, dashboards. I love dashboards. I yeah, dashboard. and I would love to see uh, uh, information come out of this that could maybe be fed into, you know, thinking about a collection development dashboard. Just my personal thought. Can we take the last 10 or 15 minutes or so once we get caught up here to a 
of our session to talk about what a dashboard would look like. Sure. Or, or not what it would look like, but what we would want it to, the content. I mean, we're making this up. We'll do whatever we want. We are. I <laughs> Okay, I think I am called. Oh, no, never mind. A way to separate out circulation from the owning library versus other libraries, perhaps an item status. Can you give me some more thoughts there, Jessica, about what you mean by that? I have something in my mind that I'm imagining you mean, but I want to make sure I'm correct on that. Oh, I love Marie's here. Ways to compare patron demographic data to a collection to target needed categories. That'll be a big challenge, but I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen says collection analysis, something like collection HQ. Yeah, I, I don't want to compare to a specific product out there, but that is certainly the direction of my thinking, Kathleen something to achieve the same end goals, though not necessarily the same way. Do you see an inventory system as a part of collection development? Rogan has had inventory suggestions in the past and we've used reports, but it's not a true inventory process. Um, what do you think, Jennifer? Is, do, do you see inventory as collection develop? I mean, they're certainly closely linked. I think the results of an inventory certainly would be part of collection development. I think it's a good place to start because if you don't know what you have, then do you know what you need? Other than, you know, the new popular stuff, you get the nice new ca catalog, whether digitally or in print every, every month and you go through it and you decide what you want. But I think inventory really gives you your baseline. So sure, I see inventory as being a starting point for collection development. It's certainly an, an assessment for collection well, development. Well, and I can definitely see um, let's say, and let's take an inventory scenario, but kind of broaden it past inventory a little bit. What mm -hmm. if we had a collection development tool that said, hey, here's recent copies that you have discarded or weeded or went to damage, you know, these sorts of statuses. And they have really good circulation. And this was their circulation in, you know, like the last 18 months, 36 months, whatever. And so you probably want to buy replacements for these. Sure. I mean, that seems like a very, it can be dangerous to use the term simple here, but a straightforward tool to have as part of a dashboard. Um, I'm copying Anita's question now, and it is a question, a suggestion there. Um, you might know the answer to that. Is there a way to limit group holds to, to just item, to, well, you can read that one that I've highlighted. There's a way to limit group holds to our items. We want to put all the staff magazines on hold to different groups or departments. If other libraries don't keep the new items with age protection, it will target any available instead of ours. There are ways to approach that kind of thing. Um, as always with holds, the devil's in the details. Um, you know, I, I would say file a uh, support ticket with your IT slash hosting entity. I think I'm duplicating things on this now. All right, I'm trying Let's to catch see. up to where I am. Here we are. Nicole so says of... she agrees with Benjamin, looking to see if a series circulates. I'm back and forth finding out what items are in the series, opening the bib record and the item record to see stats. So something that yes. collects all of that in a convenient view. Mm -hmm. To a series dashboard, that would be lovely. Well, and I can envision a sort of author dashboard where you pull up an author and it finds all the instances of works by that author, either primary or added, and gives you information about, you know, the circulations of those works. A faceted dashboard. Uh, I could also imagine it for series and even genres. Mm-hmm. to say about anything that's indexed you could do that people have so many good ideas i'm having trouble keeping up i know the author <laughs> dashboard i'm not going to copy those down but yes author dashboard would be very very cool faceted dashboard they, yeah, we, yeah so that's a big one 
Um, Ruth, there's been conversation about an author page. Integrating a dashboard would be great. Yep. Oh, Benjamin Publishers. Yes. Let's not forget publishers. Yep. Um, other Benjamin, perhaps a way to follow or compare collections at various branches or libraries in the consortium. Yes. Yeah. Is it checking out here or is it checking out there, right? I think that's well, part I mean, of... let's... Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, if you're going to pull up, I, I'm having a complete blank brain right now, but a popular author, um, you know, you definitely want to see how do they circulate at one branch versus another. Mm -hmm. And I will throw into that, it, you want to see if copies circulate from one branch at another more. Right. Because if items are constantly going in transit to fulfill somewhere else, Ruth yeah, just I, got banned from the chat. That's all I'm saying. Ruth is just Yeah, banned. I was specifically trying not to bring that author <laughs> mm -hmm. up because yep. of recent controversy. <laughs> or just because he irritates Catalog. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> the, uh, the omnipresent. Um, back to uh, what we were talking there before. I, I One of the conversations you and I had early on when we were thinking about this, it's one of the things I've, I've long wanted to be able to do in Evergreen. Um, from a resource sharing consortium standpoint is to mm -hmm. be able to more easily see what my, for example, what my library is lending. So what people are borrowing from me in high numbers mm -hmm. and what I'm borrowing from other libraries. So am I borrowing a lot of other stuff and, and paying whatever that might be? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So let's see. Yeah. So to be able to really analyze what am I lending? What am I borrowing? Let me throw in an additional element to that. Mm -hmm. um, what if there were some metrics you could store that said like here's our all our, our average transit cost mm -hmm. what if you could even associate that per brand oh, man you're that, that's and crazy. then for consortiums get an idea of what you know the cost is there i mean it may not be perfect but if you but it'd be a a, a, a ballpark mm -hmm. i mean for consortiums that, you know, do resource sharing, um, I'll put Benjamin Murphy on the spot here. I mean, what would you think about something that gave estimates of costs <laughs> for the trans for the transits and stuff? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's been a few years now since I've actually been in a consortium doing that rather than supporting them. But I mean, this was this is a constant topic of conversation. How much does it actually cost to move stuff around? And if you can identify where you can purchase copies to reduce that. Kate asked for me to zoom in. Is that better? Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think Benjamin's picking up what you're saying there about being able to reduce transit co costs by purchasing more copies and putting them in the place where they will, where they're circulating. Right. But I will throw out that it's not unique, of course, to uh, uh, resource sharing consortiums. I think you could also drill it down to like a system level. And if you use floating collections, it can be really useful for floating or doing analysis for manually moving copies between your locations. So I think we could kill several birds with one stone there. Well, and I, I've also long loved the idea, and this is somewhat related to resource sharing, but the idea of new to me collections. If you've got, for example, an audiobook collection that you feel stale in your library, but you're in a system that, you know, if you've got titles that your neighboring library doesn't have, just ship them over there because you're all your audiobook readers have perhaps listened to everything you have. So take what you have, send them over, and you can just have a, you know, a discovery shelf there to say these are new to our library. They're not necessarily newly published. I like the whole new to me thing, but you have to have data to back that up to be able to see what hasn't checked out of your library for a while and what they don't have. Well, in the spirit of brainstorming, what if, uh, you know, this theoretical dashboard mm -hmm. would say, okay, your library system has these two branches and here are the audio books by Dan Brown and their circulation has really dropped off at branch A where they're physically located but Dan Brown does well at Branch B where these items are not. Right. Um, circulation, let me do this here. Our location. So, okay. I do like to make things pretty. I'm not gonna get 
start doing that today. I'll pretty this up later. That's my promise. Okay, so we've got author, publisher, title, series. What else do we have here? Yeah, I, I want to acknowledge somebody else mentioned a proprietary product for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to keep the conversation away from proprietary products if we can. Some of them can be quite protective of what they consider their intellectual property with design. And yeah. we don't want to ever create a perception that we're potentially copying somebody yeah. else's proprietary work. Yes, we can't create a launchpad bug to say make it look like this thing that somebody yeah. else offers. Yeah. And I certainly don't think anybody who's mentioned one of the proprietary vendors is doing that here. I don't nope. want that perception either. Uh, I just want to be careful and request that people don't say, hey, I want to feature like X in product Y. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to say there's not some some good quality analysis that comes out of those. Just saying. Oh, no, not at all. What but, can come but what I would request is that if people have like a feature in a product they've used, Describe it in your own terms of what you want, rather than in terms of being from that product. Yeah. Does that make sense? Definitely. Well said. Sometimes one book goes out several times a year, but always for the same page. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or, okay, I won't name names, but I do know uh, folks that because they know their weeding policies and they're those those books that they are, are very very um protective of and they don't want them to ever be weeded so they make sure that they've got them on their list to check out at least once a year so it might be nice to know if it really just goes to one person yep. hear that. tracking things like unique users and certs um yeah that's difficult with anonymization um, yeah I, I'm a big proponent of anonym, anonymization. So, I mean, my instinct would be to say that however, whatever tools get made should not rely on identifying patrons. If that makes sense. Although pulling demographic data that's in the uh, available in the anonymized tables, absolutely. Okay, I just got to Mary's note about a way to track circulation that allows us to do a diversity audit of collections. I think mm -hmm. that's worth taking, yeah. because absolutely that's um, where one of our ideas came from is a conference we presented at, I don't know, this year or last year, I don't know. Part of that was also about a diversity audit. So let's talk for a minute mm -hmm. about what you would want to get out of that, out of that yeah. diversity audit, because I think it's an excellent idea. And it touches on a topic that's difficult in collection development to me, which is how do you determine what isn't there? Yes. If you don't have collection to handle um, a genre, a subject uh, uh, for a given population, how do you know you don't? Mm -hmm. uh, comparing to other libraries, that is an excellent point from Benjamin, and that is the traditional way. And I'm going to go ahead and throw it out here since, you know, we're brainstorming and this is thinking big, but what if we could share data with each other's anonymized um, transaction and bibliographic data that could be cross shared between systems um, for people finding collection gaps and things like that. Never spelled anonymized right the first time in my yeah. life. Anonymized. In the spirit there. of brainstorming, I'm not proposing a methodology for doing that. Just, you know, that it would be cool to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much of that comes back to you just making sure your your bib records have those subject headings, your genres, your audiences, all of that stuff on there. So it probably starts with, you know, that kind of just basic analysis first. If you have, you know, 40% of your collection doesn't have a subject heading, then that's going to be left out of your analysis. Unless you've got shelving locations that tell you that. Yeah. 
Let's see. Kate says, we're going through that right now. We were looking at our CRT materials and our nonfiction collection development selector knew she had ordered specific titles, but we couldn't bring them up in the search results because their subject headings weren't in line with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it hurts, but a more common story than any of us would like to admit. A way to compare recommended lists and suggestions to existing catalog without manually searching one by one. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. And maybe a way to share those with other evergreen libraries. I'm coming back to the sharing, but, you know, we make our jobs easier if we can, you know, share stuff between us. And we're talking big picture here, but let me suggest that if we come back to any of this we're doing, it always helps to have a subset of, of data to talk about. So do we have mm -hmm. thoughts about how we would, how you would start such a, a diversity audit? You, you can't just tackle the whole collection at once. I'm just throwing that question out there about where would you start in your collection to, oops. Yeah. This is the problem I can't copy and paste at the same time and talk. I'm going to stop talking, do that out there. Anita said our library ranked high for transiting materials. It makes us wonder what we're transiting out and requesting in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can do that with reports now, but I think there's a clear desire for tools to streamline that and provide a little bit of being able to sort of uh, dig down, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That also gets into a topic that's close to my heart, which is consortial behaviors and resource sharing, which <laughs> Um, I, myself and one other person are the only two people to have ever published statistical data in this area. Um, so it's a subject close to my heart. Um, and I, I'm not going to get into that too much right now, but I will say the statistics usually surprise people who have preconceptions that don't actually play out in reality. Yes. And I think once you start getting into the numbers, it, there are a lot of surprises that, that you find there. Yeah, and to echo Kate, yeah, a lot of this is doable with reports, but I mean, computers are here to make our lives easier. Yeah. <laughs> In theory. I'm not and sure why are we all theory. running? I mean, even <laughs> if, I'm, I'm coming back to, even if we have something like a dashboard that uh, can be accessed through the simple reporter, we're doing now why are we all individually having to run our reports i mean that's what streamlining is to me it, you know it's almost that on demand it's there for you would be very very nice that's the, the beauty of a dashboard though isn't it i mean that's so yeah well, no, we I can get of... a lot of this now but mm -hmm. yeah. i mean I, i'm as we're talking about this i'm kind of trying to visualize in my mind what a proof of concept you know, collection development dashboard might look like, starting really simple. But. I think Anita's made a couple of good points here too. Um, I like the way she describes this. Exactly what don't we have here and what do they want there? Right, absolutely. Yeah. Then the follow-up, but collection development wants to know what they will want then. So a little bit of our mind reading. But I think with some... I think it's possible to get partway there. Some, you know, sometimes analysis can show you future trends. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Benjamin mentions inventory. I think there's a need for more, for, for an actual inventory interface in Evergreen. That's my personal opinion. Um, I actually, many years ago, the better part of a decade ago, tried to get funding partners in the Evergreen community for it uh, before I was at Equinox, and there wasn't enough interest at the time. If there are people interested in that development, uh, I can put you in touch with somebody named Andrea, who would be glad to talk to you about it. <laughs> Yeah, I think what Benjamin just described is unfortunately the, the, the reality for a lot of people just in the stacks with an iPad and Google Sheets, scanning, scanning, yeah. scanning. 
Elaine mentioned that Pines uh, worked to get inventory development going as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see, now that's nice that she still has the specs. So we wouldn't be starting from complete scratch. I think the specs are still valid too. I mean, what people need in inventory has not changed in the interim. It would probably need some updating, but. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Technology's there. I think the call still goes out. You know, if people are in, if there are funders that are interested in that. Yep. I would love to see it happen. Mm -hmm. As somebody who, uh, you know, I sit on this side doing data work and coding now, but once upon a time, I was out there with my, you know, report created pull lists and looking at the items on the shelf. I was actually notorious for being an aggressive reader. <laughs> I, I liked making it easy for people to find stuff and getting rid of the stuff that was in their way. What a rebel you are. Oh, the one thing I, I meant to open with is I was going to prod you to tell you a really cool story about um, your analysis of DVD. Was it DVDs, movies, about what actor yeah. was the most popular? Yeah, I was talking to somebody and I helped them out a little bit. And I was doing some uh, analysis by actor um, and not just, and I wanted anywhere they were an added entry in the record. Uh, so we were doing analysis and I found that the best circulating DVDs in the collection were for Bruce Campbell. Anything, there were, he had loyal fans that would just check out and repeatedly check out anything Bruce Campbell was in. That surprised me so much. I know that at times you said, okay, and guess what it is? Nobody guesses Bruce Campbell. But yep. yep. Mm -hmm. No, not anybody else, Amy. Especially not Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> I mean, at that in that data set, it may be different at a different library. And it was a few years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't <laughs> recent. But I thought it was a fun little question to answer. But that's the kind of thing you can do when you're looking at collection development too. I mean, who was the? So that just means you have to buy everything that Bruce Campbell has ever made. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum might guess Bruce Campbell. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, so we've got a lot here. How should we try to put these together? Do we want to talk dashboard specifically? Or are there things that are not dashboard? I am scrolling slowly back up the list. Well, that you let's start with this. that. Do we have non-dash, non-new feature topics? Do we have anything in here that would be a sort of wish list add-on for existing functionality? Okay. Uh, to answer Carolyn, yes, it was dependent on 700s. <laughs> And as Kate says, and I'm just going to repeat her, this all comes back to correct cataloging. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Maybe I mean, Jeff Goldblum catalogers just didn't, you know, put his name in all the right places. Let's just say. I mean, this, I, I've said variations of this before, but everything libraries do essentially is built on top of the catalog and catalog. Yeah. It, well, maybe not some program, but yeah. even pro programs often use the materials that have to be cataloged. Mm -hmm. Depends on the program. But. All right, uh, Benjamin, I think a lot of what folks have been asking for makes sense to add to the item status screen, new fields to display, add to the column picker, make available in reports. Yeah. So that would be useful to identify those things that could go into Launchpad as additional information in the item status screen. Yeah. Um, I do have some concern there that screen's already pretty crowded in a lot of ways, although we could probably go downward uh, for a sort of separate pane of information. So what should go into the item status screen? Let's pull that out separately. Yeah, because I'm thinking you know, there where you, which I call is, you know, the Everybody loves Adam's item screen because it just gives you the most information anywhere ever. But the things that are already there are very helpful as far as the number of circulations. But what else can it tell us here? So these new fields to display. 
is really we're talking history at this point, aren't we? Would we want to break out um, different circulation counts in the item status screen, like circulations in the last year, circulations to other branches, circulations outside uh, to other consortial members? We'd have to think about how to define some of those things because you can have different kinds of org unit setups in Evergreen. But we're not really worrying about the how right now. This is just what we want to see. Yeah, and Ruth makes a good step that, yeah, right, but now that we have the ability to manage those action menus, if people aren't using them, you could angularize the item status. So Andrea also brought up, uh, she says she has a controversial suggestion. Uh, can we rename it something not item status? That's a name that means something totally different to everyone who isn't an evergreen. What about a like item statistics tab or something? I'm just throwing it out. I would say it's not that controversial because it's a really good point. I mean, status to me means status. What's what's going on with my item? But there's so much more right. there. We have a vote. We have a second vote for statistics. Yeah, people use your like buttons to say what you like for those. <laughs> uh, it looks like Andrea's item details is currently winning the race. I like that one. Oh, it's tying with statistics now. I love this. We have a race going. <laughs> well, we'll rock, paper, scissors it later. But. Yep. Total circs, total circs, current year. I mean, that's a start, isn't it? I'm trying to make sure I capture these. Bill has a related bug here. Let's see what it is. Port item status interface to Angular. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, and I like this Michelle suggestion about how you could show or hide fields right on the detail screen. Oh, I like that a lot. You're not, I want to make sure I haven't missed anything. Separate kind of item status interface. I think this combined thing here too, yeah? Could it tie in series linked? Um, I don't know. I think in a first iteration, it probably wouldn't, but later, maybe so. We had statistics in some tab, we would have so much more for all the stats. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Title level certs, meta level certs, local certs, remote certs. Yes, all those. All those. All. And, and I'm very much in favor of some way of identifying what is a local institution versus a remote one for resource sharing consortiums. Yes. Initial checkout versus renewal. Good thought, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm skipping over the item take the u away from item status you get item stats oh i love it okay um still not catching this i'm a little behind sorry i'm catching up here i can't stop that's all right uh, i will note that since bill has a branch out there for the item status angular screen i am going to go ahead and assign myself to it for testing i will test it tomorrow during the hackathon and oh. hopefully provide a sign off. Lovely. Uh, my mouse is. Uh, Bill says it probably needs a rebase. Well, if you do a rebase, Bill, I will keep an eye on it. And when it's available, I will test it. And is this the the one you shared there, the 193? Yeah. Yeah, the item status interface to Angular. 
getting that in will be helpful for um, the additional features we want to do, having that already there as the starting point. Okay, so just to kind of recap, we're talking about putting a turbo drive on the item status screen. Oops, ignore that. Highlighter. Okay, so the different categories we've got making the item status screen give us turning item status into stats. We've talked about doing a diversity audit and, and what that might look like. So that's kind of a specific sort of thing that we want to ferret out more definition. And then we've got our dashboard and all the things above there go on the dashboard, all the things above. Okay. So we've got three different categories now. Anything else that I think needs to my catalog is kicking in. Anything else that needs to be categorized <laughs> as we're looking at this list that you think we want to pull out separately? Yeah, uh, th this isn't for a brainstorming session, but I will just say that for the dashboard, um, mm -hmm. I, I think before we file it in Launchpad, we'll want to you know narrow that into a more actionable thing. Absolutely. Um, but we don't need to do that now. The session's for brainstorming. And we can do that through our various communication avenues there. Yeah, okay. Andrea says there's a lot of devils in dashboard details. Absolutely sure. true. Um, but I thought this would be a good time to make sure that, you know, we as a community could have a chance to all just throw stuff against the whiteboard and see what sticks. I'm scrolling back to the top. So let's see. Chronological hold request relevant to specific author series. We haven't talked much about then uh, serving this, the hold request. I mean, that, that's part of saying what people are wanting. But so if we're well, capturing things. And I think that that sort of chronological data, you know, showing trends over time mm -hmm. is going to be really important to pretty much everything we're talking about. Because, I mean, it's all nice and good if a book is checked out an average of, you know, 30 times a year, but if it hasn't checked out at all in the last three years, we want to know that. So yeah, I think those chronological trends are going to be a recurring thing. Okay. Let me go back up. Let's see, anything else here? Uh, get CERC stats based on bid brokered subjects and item record shelving locations. Yep. yep. Better ways to analyze subject headings. Now that's a little different. And we, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but analyzing subject headings. Would that be a dashboard thing or would that be more um, uh, of a reporting? Maybe it's a different. Better ways to analyze subject headings, mm -hmm. density, coverage, length. I, I think that when we talk about a dashboard, we're going to end up having so many different things we potentially want to look at that there's going to end up being tabs on this dash. Right. And, and I think that would be a distinct tab on the dashboard. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, almost a bib analysis yeah. tab on the dashboard. I'm going to bring that down here specifically so we don't lose that. And I'm kind of speaking outside the scope of, you know, this chat here. But, uh, you know, there are different ways to approach this kind of project, one of which is to, you know, detail everything and, you know, everything you want and try to figure out all the possible features and do it up front. Um, I tend to be more kind of a rapid iterator personality where I'd rather start with something simple and limited in scope as a proof of concept and put it out and then add on over time. There are pros and cons to both. Permissions. Um, yeah. Well, I'm. there are a couple of S components to what Carolyn is asking. Uh, so I, I want to actually start with the second part. What do people think about this information for patrons. I've only imagined it as for staff. Um, is there a patron you, 
I, I mean, I could see this potentially being used to make recommendations in some cases. Okay. But, but yeah, I, I at least personally was not imagining this as a patron facing thing at all. Uh, sorry to interrupt for a moment. Um, I know I'm moderating this session, but I also have a presentation I'm making in track one. Jennifer, is okay if you dig over? I got it. Thanks, Gina. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can see some of the information being useful for patrons, but I would probably mentally scope that into a separate, you know, tool of some kind. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think providing better series information to patrons is certainly desirable. And I could certainly see if we develop logic for analyzing series, how that would be useful to repurpose for patron facing info, but in a different way. Maybe same back end, some of the same back end code, but yeah. But probably presented in a different way. I could definitely see like logging into my account or clicking on an item and getting some sort of recommendations. Um, to me, that's a separate thing from this, but some of the same backend work could get repurposed for it. Okay, so following up on the other permissions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go back to what I said about uh, patron privacy and anonymization. I personally would envision this using a data view uh, for patron information that basically pulls out the same information that is in the anonymized tables. So I wouldn't see it as being particularly sensitive. And uh, I personally wouldn't mind scoping it under existing cataloger permissions. I'm not sure it would need entirely new ones, especially since it's purely informational in my view. You don't use it to make changes to the collection directly. And that said, depending on how those catalog or permissions are, are done, even that might be limiting because in some systems, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, no, having catalog or permission gives you a lot of, a lot of power and then a lot, so therefore many people don't have it. So if you wanted to make this information available to staff in general, yeah, I, I think permissions comes down to so many local decisions, honestly. But I guess the question is, would we want it to be able to be scoped by permission? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, th there's a point at which yeah. I worry that permissions become a huge mess mm -hmm. for staff to handle. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly is necessary when you can change items and change patron data and all those things. Mm -hmm. But you know, when it's purely informational and not sensitive yeah. information, uh, uh, my instinct is to not create additional things to manage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to respond to Elaine, I'm specifically saying it would not expose patron data, at least as I envision it. If it exposed patron data, that becomes a whole different thing for permissions. At the most, maybe one permission for the for the dashboard itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not a favor of adding things that unnecessarily expose patron data. We already have reports is already a problem for that. That drives me kind of nuts. Yeah, and we're going on a little bit about the yeah, now we're about how to do it aren't we yeah. but yeah um, but 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 yeah i think i think anytime you look at functionality that accesses any form of patron information you have to ask you know do i really need any patron identifying information in here i'm gonna call it stats i wanted to back back up i think benjamin made a point that I think is very telling. Um, does, does think any 
anybody in my library has report permissions, we have at least a dozen librarians doing collection development. And that's probably the thing that's put the light bulb over my head more than anything today is, yeah, you've got people doing collection development that don't have ready access tools to be able to give them information about their collection. Because right now you're either running reports or what are you doing? You're asking somebody else for that information. And I potentially see this development as a way to give fewer staff reporting permissions. Right. Because, I mean, let's take the hypothetical scenario of you're a cataloger and you've had to get tons of reports training and you have to run reports to do your collection development. And not only would this potentially make your life easier, but then you wouldn't have to have reporting permissions because you would only hopefully need the dashboard or need reports and frequently enough that somebody else can do them. Maybe that's overly idealistic of me, but we said at the beginning we were thinking big. Mm -hmm. And yes, I would love for us to be able to reduce the need for access to the reporter because, mm -hmm. yeah. I would do. Pay, well, for anybody who didn't follow the end of that chain of thought of mine, patron privacy, that's <laughs> why I want to reduce. Yes, because if we're concerned about that, I mean, that, that's exactly, well, it's not exactly, but it is the reason that I, I believe some decisions are made about not to give people access or the permissions to write reports is for exactly that reason. So if we can anonymize the data, I huh, said it right the first time, anonymize that data and pull it into a dashboard and still give people that are making decisions about the collection yep. the information they need, that's a win-win for everybody. Right. That's my viewpoint. Okay, so we've got a little less than 10 minutes. Let's go back up and see if there's anything else that we want to make sure we spend time on. Circulation data from the bib. Well, we didn't talk about that, did we? I mean, so here, and I don't remember, I didn't capture names. Circulation data from the bib. Are we looking here potentially when you're looking at the bib record to have the circulation info right there? When you're in the title record, another tab on the title record with CERT data? Are we talking more about that, that imploding the, not imploding, exploding the item status screen? This is different. So we're ta we talked a lot about how you could get all this on item status and turn it into item stats. But would we want to do that on the bib? I can certainly see some of the information potentially that way and duplicated between the two interfaces. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling if we offer it, I don't know of a reason to object to. Yes, if we could have it on the bib itself. I mean, I can see some of the information being different, but I can see a lot of duplication between them. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Not at all. I mean, I can come up with a variety of ideas just off the top of my head about, you know, if you've got, you know, one item that's got pretty good search stats, but if you, what, if you have 15 items on that bib record and only one of them is really circulating, then, you know, so we've perhaps got about you could 70, kill a few of them. Yeah. So we've got a little over five minutes left. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw out a sort of proposal here for going forward. Great. Um, just see what people think. Uh, what if we take this and we go to the cataloging interest group uh, and this isn't necessarily something that would happen, you know, in today's interest group meeting, but over the next few months, uh, detail out what we might want from, you know, a new bib tab, a new item tab, file launch pads for those, and see what the interest would be in a prototype collection development dash, you know, what people would want on an initial one. And so that could be detailed out for Launchpad as well. This would mean that anybody who's had input here uh, would need to join us in the cataloging interest group to continue provided, providing input. Of course, and which we meet to, regularly. You know, <laughs> Jennifer's uh, uh, domination of the cataloging. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and Elaine's leading the group this afternoon to do our annual report too. So we'll have our annual meeting this afternoon. And then we meet again on July the 12th, just throwing that out there, 
I don't know yeah. if we want to revisit it that quickly. We can because, you know, our July meeting is supposed to be the follow up to the conference anyway. So by this, we mean Rogan and Jennifer will summarize. Yep. We'll summarize. And, you know, I just want to see at the end of the process, which isn't going to be today, certainly, mm -hmm. but, you know, no, 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 no. potentially actionable things. Right. And, and again, so we'll to echo King, not just talk, but action. Yes. Turn into something. Okay. And I'm going to put maybe July here. But certainly a monthly meeting soon. Very soon. And we're talking content, so we'll, you know, the damage, the, the risk there is not to go too far in the weeds about how to make it happen, but, but really what we'd like to have. Right. And, and to, uh, Kate brings up another good point. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, others are going to want to be involved, not just cataloging interest group. But I think within the scope of the cataloging interest group, we can get a launch pad ticket together for a wish list uh, and then widen it out. Yeah. Um, I, I will tell you, attempting to figure out wish list requests by the entire community on a general list, my experience is it's a good way to make sure it never happens. Yeah. Uh, while a more concentrated group like the catalogers can at least get the ball rolling. And then once there's something out there, other people find it easier to respond to. That's my personal experience. And it's certainly one of those things, if we start with the catalogers, then, you know, we could have a just a special, yeah, right, requirements. We could have a just a special, you know, um, community kind of just brainstorming session like this to, well, brainstorming is the wrong word at that point, but to just, um, community review of it to bring back to ask for feedback. Nate, yeah. like we do feedback fast, but no, I'm not thinking that, but just have a time to we're putting it out there um, after we've gone through this kind of refining process with the cataloging interest group and then just open it up to anybody. Of course, you know, anybody's welcome to come to the cataloging interest group when we publicize what the topic's going to be. Yeah. Well, and depending on how quickly this moves ahead and uh, about another four or five months, we'll have the hack away and can certainly schedule time there for you know, sure. community discussion. So we'll need to expand involvement beyond that on there. Maybe hack away. Okay. I like that idea. Um, I will say that this, you know, I'll continue to make this look a little prettier, this document. It'll still be out there. So if people want to keep adding to it, they certainly can. So our conversation doesn't have to stop here. And shouldn't okay, I'm going to stop scrolling. Sorry. Hmm. <laughs> I forget that other people are watching my screen. So many Do you mind if I go ahead and, and just share the interstitial slide? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've got two minutes till uh, Jessica wants the space. So we're wrapping it up. Um, so I guess we need to sign off, but I really want to thank everybody for coming. I, th this, this is a topic close to my heart. So, you know, I'm really glad people came in and, you know, shared their input. Yes, I just echo that. I, this has been wonderful. And I agree with so many of your comments. This is, this is just exciting to think about. So thank you. Fabulous ideas too. We won't let it die here though, Rogan. I'll take this back no. and we'll. We'll keep pushing. We'll keep, we'll keep, keep moving forward. Thank you all. Thank you.